The Lord be with you. And also with you. We welcome you to worship on this 10th weekend after Pentecost. As we gather this evening, may we always find our ultimate peace in Christ. We ask everyone to fill out the cards there in your pews, and after the service, you can leave them in the plates at the entrances to the church. I do have a couple of announcements, but before we do that, let's take a moment to greet the folks around you. In our announcements, our annual congregational picnic is tomorrow at noon at Wilcox Park. Late service will be here, and afterward we'll head out uh, to Wilcox Park. Everybody's welcome to join us. There'll be an afternoon of food and fun and fellowship. Your bulletin has uh, more details on that. And our annual voters meeting will be on Sunday, August 25th at noon. Among the business to be discussed will be the calling of a second pastor, the budget, and the election of officers. All confirmed members of the congregation are welcome to come and participate in the meeting and in the discussions that take place. Our service this evening is Divine Service Setting 4, which is printed in your bulletin or begins on page 203 in our hymnals. We now begin with our opening hymn, hymn number 905. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from this sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father 
seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our intro it from Psalm 55. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house we walked in the throng. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Merciful Lord, cleanse and defend your church by the sacrifice of Christ. United with him in holy baptism, give us grace to receive with thanksgiving the fruits of his redeeming work and daily follow in his way through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading comes from the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 23. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word, or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the hearts of the prophets who prophesy lies, and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for, ba for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson comes from the letter to the Hebrews in chapters 11 and 12. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as if on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, 
escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we rise to sing our response. The Holy Gospel, which serves as the basis for the sermon, is written in the 12th chapter of St. Luke, beginning at the 49th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is the Gospel of the Lord. we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. 
he suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The hymn of the day is hymn 655, and you may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. In the Pew Bible, it's found on page 1036. And to start, I'll read our Lord's words again in verse 51. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, in your Son, Jesus Christ, you have healed the divide between fallen sinful man and you, the Holy God. Through the forgiveness of our sins, we are now made right in your sight because of Christ, and by being, belonging to him, we have now become your children. Defend and protect us, we pray, against the divisions that seek to destroy and to tear us away from you and from one another, and in all things, make us mindful of the fact that when it comes down to Jesus, um, we are either for him or against him, that there is no middle ground. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. That verse that I just read, that verse 51, do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. That may be rather striking uh, to many of you. Because after all, isn't Jesus the Prince of Peace? Isn't he the one who says to his disciples, Peace I give to you, my peace I leave you, not as the world gives, do I give unto you? We think of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and uh, we have a hard time seeing in Jesus anything but kind of a weak person. At least that's how many in the world view Jesus. I hope that's not how you do. 
And so to come up with a statement like, I have not come to bring peace, but division, or as Matthew records it, but a sword, is again kind of discombobulating for us. Has Jesus then come to establish a religion the same way so many other religions were formed? At the sword, convert or die? Of course not. Here, Jesus did come to bring peace. Peace to human hearts. Peace to those who were at odds with God and with themselves. He has come to destroy the works of the devil, and we know that some of the work of the devil is division and discord. So what is Jesus talking about here? He is not talking about what he wants to occur. He is reminding his disciples of what reality is because of him. I have said on other occasions, and it bears repeating in connection to this, uh, to this passage of Scripture, when you talk in generic terms about God, nobody gets too ruffled over it unless he's a really virulent atheist. Most people have some concept of God, and if you leave it sort of general and vague, nobody's threatened, nobody's put on the spot, everybody can talk about the big guy in the sky or the man upstairs or their version of God, and we can all get along just fine. But when you get specific about God in the person of Jesus Christ, now you've drawn a line in the sand. And that's when you're about to face opposition. And this is what Jesus is reminding his disciples of here in the appointed reading. Earlier in Luke, he had, he had talked to his disciples that they are to acknowledge him before men, not to deny him, to not worry about accumulating earthly things because their heavenly father knows how to care for them and to provide for them. Um, he also tells them the importance of being ready because we do not know when the end is going to be uh, and so we must keep watch. And in the middle of this, of this proclamation we pick up at verse 49 where Jesus says, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. This is this is both fire in regards to his purifying work, but also in that final judgment that he is coming. Uh, John the Baptist said of Jesus that he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is on the verge here now of accomplishing what he had been sent by his heavenly Father to do. But again, it wasn't to establish an earthly kingdom of a thousand years of millennial peace on earth where the wolf lays down with the lion and all of that sort of expectation that Jewish people in Jesus' day had when Messiah would come. Uh, but he is looking to the fact that, that there is a judgment that is coming and how I wish it were already here to put an end to the struggle, to put an end to the evil, to put an end to the suffering, to the death, to the works of the devil, how I wish it were already here. But before that final judgment would come, there is something that has to happen first. Verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress, my distress until it is accomplished. This baptism is the cross. You know, St. Paul talks about baptism in, in Romans and in Colossians as being a death and burial and resurrection for those who are baptized into Christ. Jesus here is speaking of a baptism that he is going to undergo when he will go to the cross to bear our sins when he will have to suffer and die. It is not some simple, easy um, uh, thing for the Son of God to do. Yes, he is the Son of God, true God, begotten of the Father from all eternity. But he's also true man. And so the anxiety and the affliction and the, the horror of what he is facing is pressing heavily upon him here. I wish it were all over. I wish the judgment day would come and everything be accomplished, but that's not the time yet. I have to go through this baptism. I have to go to the cross, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. 
Think about it. Here he is facing what he knows he will be bearing. All of the ugliness, all of the sin, all of the violence, all of the perversity, um, everything that brings judgment and death and hell to the world, he is taking into himself for us and for all so that none of us at that last day of fire and judgment will have to fear. And he is going through this distressed period. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, just before he was arrested and carried off to trial and then crucified the next day, he prayed, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. As he prayed, he sweat drops of blood, a, a medical condition that has been verified where one under extreme anxiety and pressure, the capillaries of the body actually dilate and blood oozes through the pores of the skin. He was truly going through hell, both in the garden and especially on the cross. That was his baptism into death for us. And that has to be accomplished so that sinners would not be lost, but instead found and given life. But his saving work on the cross, you would think, well, this would be great. Once he goes to the cross, defeats sin, death, and devil, and rises again to life, well, that should usher in a new era of peace. And again, the disciples were expecting that even after Jesus' resurrection. And so he asked the question, do you think that I've come to give peace on earth? Do you think that that's going to be the outcome of what I am here to do? No, I tell you, but rather division. This is the reality. He came to give peace to all. He came to die for all. He bore on himself the sins of all. But sadly, there would be many who would remain opposed to Jesus, who would remain opposed to the idea that we cannot save ourselves by what we do for God. But rather, we have to put our trust in someone else. People don't like that. Old Adam does not like that. The old sinful nature always wants to think that we contribute toward um, our salvation, that we, uh, our salvation depends upon us. Oh, sure, believe in Jesus, right, but, and whenever they stick but on the end of believe in Jesus, you know they've taken their eyes off of Jesus. And so there will be those who ostensibly claim to be Christian and yet stand opposed to Jesus because they don't want to forsake their sin and they don't want to have to admit that they're sinners. They just want to see Jesus as the one who gives his approval to every desire that we have. And so they will oppose anyone who stands in the way of that. And certainly the world stands in opposition. Remember I said you talk generic God or God little g? Nobody gets too threatened. You talk about Jesus. You talk about him as the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. You're going to get blowback. And you should be aware of that, just as he is making his disciples aware of that 2,000 years ago. It's not going to be an easy ride to be a Christian. It, it requires sacrifice on our parts, just as it required our Lord to sacrifice so much to bring about our salvation and to to miss that truth, to somehow think that being a Christian is just, well, that's just a natural thing, and what's the big deal? Uh, is leaving us open then to shock and dismay and perhaps even uh, disillusionment. Jesus tells the parable in Matthew of the parable of the sower of the seed, uh, the four different types of soil that the seed fell on. One of the types of soil was rocky soil, and, uh, and Jesus tells here that the rocky soil are those who initially receive the word with joy, but because that person is not firmly rooted, when persecution or tribulation comes, they fall away on account of the word because they had no root. Jesus is telling us these things 
so that we don't become offended when we face blowback and resistance and yes even division and sadly it can happen even within the closest relationships uh, that we have here um, 50 uh, 52 from now on in one house there will be five, five divided three against two and two against three they will be divided father against son son against father mother against daughter and daughter against mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law the most close human relationships, sadly, will be divided because of Jesus. And again, not because that's his wish or his will, but he knows the human heart. And he knows what will take place. Do we? Do we truly understand it? Do we truly believe it? I think the closer that we get toward the end of all things, the closer we get to the time when the fire will come, we will see more and more uh, uh, division between those who are Christ's and those who are not. Not the petty divisions, and maybe not so petty divisions between church bodies or individual Christians who disagree over some theological point, I'm talking the black and white division of those who are of Christ and those who are not. They will hate you, but we are not to hate them. They will mistreat you. We are not to mistreat them in return. Because again, our Lord Jesus himself when he was reviled, did not revile or insult, but he entrusted himself to his heavenly Father. So we, uh, in following our Savior's footsteps, even the way of the cross, we may uh, experience resistance and we may experience loss. But you know what? That's not all we will experience. It may take years. It may take time. But in remaining faithful to our Lord, there will be those times where the great divide is actually bridged and that the Lord works through us to bring to him those who were at one time were opposed, to make out of our enemies friends and perhaps even to break through the hardened hearts of stubborn moms and dads or sons or daughters or husbands and wives who dig in their heels for years. But as we remain faithful, loving, and true to our Savior who is faithful, loving, and true to all, perhaps the Holy Spirit will bring them to us once more and that we can share together these blessings no longer divided by unbelief and rejection of Christ, but rather receiving his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep each of your hearts and minds in true faith to life eternal, amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. In our prayers this evening, we pray for Larry Potter, who is hospitalized, for strength and healing for Judy Lipsky, Linda Jackson, Darlene Rothy, Karen Cray, and Jerry Brady. Uh, we give thanks to God for Aaron and Erica Karg as they celebrate their 16th wedding anniversary. And our prayers of sympathy for the family of Betty Jo Schumann. Uh, that would be uh, our Villa Schumann's uh, sister-in-law. Betty Jo passed away this last Wednesday. At the conclusion of our prayers, we continue then with the service of the sacrament. Let us rise for prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, did come to give his life as a ransom for our souls and to bring to us peace with you, having been justified by faith in Christ. And yet the reality that our, our Lord warns us about is that there will be those in this life who will oppose us because of our connection to Christ. 
and it may be even some who are closest to us. And so, dear Lord, anchor us and root us firmly in your word and in, in faith in Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins and raised again to life. Continue, O oh Lord, to keep us steadfast in your word so that even when we do encounter resistance or opposition, that we would not cave into the pressures and simply uh, forsake the faith and deny Christ before men, but that in love and gentleness we would be ready to give an answer to the hope that we have within us. And even as our Lord does remind us that there will be division uh, on account of him, so also the scriptures tell us that he, Jesus, is the one who breaks down the dividing wall of hostility between peoples in order to unite them once more. And this does take place within your church. This does take place between many disparate peoples um, who otherwise might be at war with one another who are now at peace because we share and confess the same Christ. And so, dear Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to go out through us, through your holy people, so that we would be the ones who would help bridge the divide and to bring back those who have gone astray. Dear Father, we commend Larry, uh, Judy, Linda, Darlene, Karen, and Jerry into your hands. Be for them a God of healing, comfort, and strength. According to your will, grant to them a healing of body and uphold them in soul. We rejoice with Aaron and Erica as you have blessed them with 16 years of marriage and with their kids. Continue to watch over and keep them faithful to their marriage vows in the years ahead. Help their family to continue to rejoice in your good gifts to them and in all things, dear Father, we pray your blessing on all marriages uh, that, that there would be not discord but harmony and love. And finally, we pray that you would comfort the family of Betty Jo Schumann, whose soul you have called home to yourself. Comfort them, even in the midst of their tears, so that they can look beyond the grave to him who has conquered death in the grave, our Lord Jesus Christ. And may they truly understand that though weeping may last for a nighttime, the nighttime of this life, joy will come in the morning, the morning when the resurrection of the dead takes place. All of these things we bring before you and give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit 
and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promise salvation by a second Adam, your son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen.
serve you in body and in soul unto life everlasting. Depart in peace.
Our service continues with the singing of the Nunc Dimittis, and we rise. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may, together with all your saints, celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.